Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord of Lords and King of Kings a shout in this place. Come on, man. Let's lift up King Jesus. Let's lift up King Jesus. Can we give Michael a round of applause as well? Let's give Michael a round of applause. Come on, man. Big up yourself, bro. Appreciate you, man. Praise God. It's my honor to be delivering the word to you today about the kingdom. Um, I'd also like to thank those who preached about the kingdom before me. Daniel, Jasnef, Rona. Let's give them a round of applause as well. Amen. All right, so we've been in the kingdom series and we were through it throughout the month of November, but we're going to continue in the month of December. And the reason why we're going to continue is because it's vitally important for you to understand that when you gave your life to Jesus, you did not join just a religion, but you joined a kingdom. Someone say a kingdom. When Jesus came to earth, he spoke about one thing, the kingdom. Someone say the kingdom. And most of his parables started off, the kingdom of heaven is like... His first message when he came to earth was repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not the religion of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven. When people think about Jesus, they think about this religious guy, right? But Jesus actually exposed the religious tradition in the Pharisees and he always spoke about the kingdom. So when you study Jesus, you're going to see that this man didn't come to bring a religion to add to the other list of religions in the world. Jesus didn't come to bring something that was better than Judaism. He came to bring a kingdom that was ushered in through the Holy Spirit. In fact, I think it's important to tell you that the Holy Spirit sort of messes with our chances of becoming another religion. Because we don't just worship him, he's now inside of us. Right? So the Holy Spirit is actually the difference that separates us between other religions. Does that make sense? The Bible says unless one is born of the Spirit and of the water, he cannot enter the kingdom. So when you were born again, you entered into a kingdom. And an important distinction is a kingdom is not a religion. Can we say that together? A kingdom is not a religion. A religion is something that mankind creates to understand their God better. But a kingdom is a government that's set up by a king. And Jesus, the Bible speaks of him in Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And to the reign of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So the reason for Jesus' birth was one for government and for kingdom. So before we get into our message, I want to cement something in, within you, that when you gave your life to the king of kings, you joined a religion, yes, but you also joined a kingdom. Someone say a kingdom. The Bible speaks about how we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. So I want you to understand something, that your Bible is bigger than religion. Religion is inside the Bible because religion is a part of humanity. James says there's such thing as pure religion. So religion's a part of the Bible, but I'm trying to let you know something, that your Bible is bigger than religion. In fact, religion's only mentioned in the Bible five times. Religious is mentioned in the Bible eight times. So really and truly, I want you to understand something. Your Bible's about a kingdom, right? Your Bible's not about religion. So if I could sum up what the whole Bible's about, the Bible's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal family. And my sermon title today might get me in trouble, but it's religion versus kingdom. There comes a moment in ministry when you have to choose between making religious people happy or making um, broken people whole. There comes a moment when you have to choose between making religious people happy or making broken people whole. And I chose the latter because that's what Jesus did. This thinking came from the way that I was saved. I was an atheist and I didn't grow up in church. So I cannot empathize with being dragged to church on a Sunday. But October the 16th, 2016, I was invited to a church and I was on the brink of my fourth suicide attempt. And in my brokenness, I heard a message, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of God's grace. And this message wasn't judgmental like I thought Christians was. This message wasn't condescending like I thought Christians were. This message wasn't fault-finding. In fact, this message was loving, compassionate, and merciful. And in my brokenness, I experienced the grace of God. And I didn't have to work for him to accept me. I didn't have to fix myself before I came to him. He accepted me as broken as I was, as perverted as I was, as weed-smoking as I was, he accepted me. And, And it was in that acceptance that sent me into a lifestyle of celibacy. It was in his acceptance that allowed me to be relationship free for three years with no urge to get into one. It was his acceptance that allowed me to be alcohol and weed free. There was something about the acceptance of God that delivered me. I experienced his grace. So much so that I left my first church after three months because the message they were preaching did not align with the Jesus that saved me. 
So yes, it was religious, it had pure devotion, it was community, it was strong, right? There were works, it was evident, they were greatly disciplined, but on the other side of the religion, there was fault finding, it was judgmental, it was merciless, and it was a side that almost excluded you from community if you left them. A side of the church that had hierarchy and it didn't align with the Jesus that I read about in scripture. Now I left and I'd done this one thing, I detoxed religion. I detoxed works because I was saved by grace through faith, not by works. So I can't boast in saving myself and I would have committed suicide if he didn't save me. I found something in King Jesus and I found the kingdom. Say thy kingdom come. In Jesus, I found that you can't win people in hate or condemnation, but we can win people in, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And so I began to wonder about this Jesus. I wanted to know him. And so I stayed in the Gospels. And everything I saw inside the Gospels was a man who would actively speak out against religious tradition and sit down with the brokenhearted. A man who wouldn't pick the rich or the Pharisees, he would pick the lowly. And so I began to wonder about my life experience. Why did I go through all that I went through? What was God's point in creating us? Did God create us with religion in mind or with relationship in mind? Did God create you with works in mind or the kingdom in mind? Because everything I saw in Jesus was anti the Christianity that I thought I knew. Let's get into our message. And it's going to be a topical sermon. And we're going to start with Genesis 1 and build our case on the kingdom. Genesis 1.26 reads, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now the word image means replica, right? So God says, let us make man as a replica and let, let us make them in our likeness, meaning let us make mankind, mankind like us. Then God says, and let them have dominion. Someone say dominion. Dominion here, the language is the rulership of kings. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, when it says dominion, it's talking about having the power to rule or having complete authority. So God created you as a replica. He created you like him and you were created with dominion. You were created with complete authority. How do I know that? Psalms 115 verse 16 says, The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. God gave you the earth to rule over it. God gave you the earth to have dominion over it. God created you to be a ruler and a replica of his. Then Psalms 8 verse 4 says, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and you have crowned him. Say, say he crowned me. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things underneath his feet. God crowned you with glory and honor. God crowned you with dominion. God crowned you with the right to rule. God put all things underneath your feet. And what that means is that everything that happens on the earth is not up to God, it's up to us. God crowned you with dominion. He honored you with rulership and free will, but he didn't give you ownership of the earth. So we were created to rule the earth, but we weren't created to own the earth. Can we say that together? We were created to rule the earth, but we were not created to own the earth. Psalms 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So if the Bible just said that the earth he has given to the children of men, but now it's saying the earth is the Lord's, what's it saying? It's like me owning a house and saying you can come and live inside my house for a bit. The earth is the Lord's, but he's given it to you. The house is the Lord's, but he's given you, it to you for you to live in, right? So God actually put us in the house. He's the landlord. He owns the house, but we are the tenants inside the house. Does that make sense? So God gave us the house to act responsibly. He said to Adam, tend the garden and keep it. He didn't say own the garden. He said tend the garden. I'm giving you the garden to tend it and to keep it. Don't abuse the garden. Just tend it. So God owns the earth, but he's given the earth to who? The children of men. Am I making sense in here? So God has almost given us the keys to his house. But then what happened was we sublet the house to someone else. We gave the keys to Satan. And the Bible literally says, yeah, that woe to the earth because Satan has come down and his time is short. So Satan has a lease on the house right now. So the earth is the Lord's, but let me switch it. The world is the devil's. Can we say that together? The earth is the Lord's, 
but the world is the devil's. Say it one more time. The earth is the Lord's, but the world is the devil's. And I need to make you understand something before we get into our message. That the earth and the world are two separate things. The earth is not the world, and the world is not the earth. So when the Bible speaks about the world, it's not speaking about the planet. When the Bible speaks about the world, it's speaking about the age. Someone say age. So the earth is the planet, but the world is the age and the culture that governs the planet. The world is the culture. Amen? So the earth is the Lord's, but the age and the culture is the devil's. How do I know it's the devil's? Let's go to John 14, 30. And the Bible reads, Jesus says this, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. Jesus said, I'm not going to speak longer with you because the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. So Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan is the God of this world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And the Bible says he has no claim on Christ. And so if you're in Christ, let me tell you right now that Satan has no claim on you. No, no, raise your hands and say he has no claim on me. Satan has no claim on you because he has no claim in Christ. If you're in Christ, you've been covered by the blood of the Son. He has no claim on you. So all Satan really is is an accuser, but he can't do anything to you. The Bible says that nothing can harm you once you're in Christ. Satan has no claim on you. And if we take this a bit deeper to understand Satan as the ruler of the world, the Bible says in the temptation that the devil took Jesus up to the high point and showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said, all these are mine because they've been delivered to me and I can hand them over to whom I will. So Satan has the kingdoms of this world. He has their authority and their glory because it's been delivered to him. And who delivered it to him? Adam. Someone say Adam. Now I want you to remember something. The earth and the world are two different things, right? So when Satan's offering Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their glory, remember the earth is the Lord's. So Jesus is the landlord. And it's like Satan saying, here, I'll give you the keys if you give me the land. It's like Satan saying, I'll give you petrol if you give me your car. It makes no sense, does it? The kingdoms of the world are going to be the kingdoms of the Christ in the book of Revelation. So essentially, Jesus is going to have the kingdoms of the world anyway. So what Satan was trying to do was he was trying to prematurely give Jesus the kingdom of the world when it's going to be Jesus anyway. Does that make sense? So the earth is the Lord's and the world is the culture. And Satan is the one that governs the culture of the world. He's the prince of the power of the air, right? And so Jesus obviously declines this invitation. Now, why do I say all of this? And I'm building a case. You weren't Satan's main target. When Satan came to the earth, he he didn't have you in mind. Satan's main target was never you. He's not interested in you at all. Satan's main target was never to rule the world. Satan's main target was God. Someone say God. I'm going to prove it. Before Satan became the God of this world, the Bible records that there was a battle in heaven in Revelation, right? And then Isaiah 14 verse 12 gives us more um, information about this. And Isaiah 14 12 reads this. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Then verse 13 tells us why Satan fell. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God and I will set my throne on high. Someone say throne. That's kingdom language. So he says, I'm going to ascend to heaven. I'm going to set my throne on high. I will, I will, I will. So before Satan became the God of this world, there was a battle for the throne in heaven. Satan wanted to be the God of heaven. I'm going to set my throne on high. So Satan's real objective was never really you. His main target was to dethrone God in heaven. And it was Satan's rebellion that got him kicked out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. In the book of Revelation, we see that Satan was kicked out and a third of the angels fell down with him. Then Ezekiel 28 shows us something interesting. Let's jump to Ezekiel 28 verse 13. How did Satan end up in the Garden of Eden? You get to Genesis 3 and you just find the serpent there, but how did he end up in the Garden of Eden? Ezekiel 28 verse 13 says, You were in Eden talking about Satan, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Then it begins to list out how beautiful Satan was. But Satan was in the Garden of Eden before mankind was. So I want you to imagine something, yeah? You're in the garden chilling. Then this new species rises up from the dirt. And he looks at them like, who the hell are you? And God calls them Adam. Or the deep Hebrew context, he calls them Elohim's rulers, right? So Lucifer is in the garden chilling. He's been kicked out of heaven. And all of a sudden, he sees these people rise from the ground who are in the image of the guy that he's beefing in heaven. 
And he sees that they're blessed in his likeness. They have dominion. They have rulership. They have everything. And Satan in his pride sees that they're going to multiply. So he sets up a battle plan. And because Satan couldn't have the throne up there, and he sees we have a throne down here, he says, because I couldn't get up there, I'm going to get a throne on the earth. So what you see from the very first pages of scripture was this was never about religion. It was about a throne. It was about kingdoms. Now we fast forward to the coming of the Messiah. And if the first Adam was connected to kingship, how much more was the second Adam connected to kingship? So Jesus didn't only come to forgive you of your sins. And if you think that's the be all and the end all of, your, of the gospel, you've missed it. Jesus came to restore you to your first. He came to restore you to sonship. Am I making sense in this church? Jesus came so sin could not have dominion over you. He came so you could be in him. He came to restore you to your rightful position as an heir to the throne. Hallelujah. And how was Jesus going to do that? 1 John 3, 8 says, hallelujah. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus did not only come to die on a cross, he came to destroy the works of the devil. The same devil that's been sinning before Eden from the beginning. And what were the works of, dev of the devil? In Luke 19, 10, it tells us, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So the works of the devil caused something to be lost. What was it? John gives us further clarity into the thing that was lost. Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. But today who received him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus gave you the power to become a child of God again. Jesus came to restore you back to your rightful position. So what Satan caused to be lost was your standing, you being an heir, you being adopted by the Father. Satan caused you to no longer stand in your kingship, in your queenship as a royal person. Am I making sense? So we need to know that the gospel is more than Jesus dying for your sins. And if we preach the gospel and stop at Jesus for, um, forgiving your sins, then we're not preaching the full gospel. The full gospel is that you are an heir to the throne. You are co-heirs with Jesus. So there's more to the gospel than just being forgiven. There's more to your faith than repentance. There's more to your faith than God, I'm sorry. On the other side of God, I'm sorry, there's an entire kingdom for you. There's a life beyond cycles of condemnation and guilt. There's a life beyond God, I'm sorry. God, I'm not worthy. There's a life beyond your sackcloth and ashes. He came to give you life and life abundantly. Someone say abundantly. Jesus died so you could live. He died so you could be born again, not so you could be religious. So you could be born again. And that's the beauty of our gospel. It doesn't matter how you were born, you can be born again. I don't care if there's alcohol in your bloodline. I don't care if there's trauma in your bloodline. The beauty of our gospel is it doesn't matter how you were born, you can be born again. I don't care what's attached to your last name. I don't care what happened in your past. The blood of the king has soaked you. The Bible says, behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So you got a new birth certificate. You've been adopted by the spirit by which you can cry out, Abba Father. You've got a new birth certificate, a new passport. You're in the world, not of the world. You're now a citizen of heaven. Praise the Lord. So once you give your life to the King of Kings and the Holy Spirit enters inside you, you've been called to royalty. Someone say, I'm royal. You've been called to dethrone whatever tried to hold you down in the past. E. Hmm. If you got saved, it's now time for you to take back everything that was stolen from you. Because you're no longer a slave, you're a ruler. You're not bound, you're free. And he gave you the right to become a child of who? God, the one that created all things. You're not approved by what you do on the mic. You're not approved by how well you sing in worship. You're approved by grace through faith. And the, it's by the grace of God that I am who I am. I am royal. Is that pride? No, it's humility. It's what God says over my life. So stop calling yourself a sinner. The Bible calls you a saint. You've been washed in the blood. You've been redeemed. You've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit as a guarantee of your inheritance. Stop speaking death over yourself. Because when you call yourself a sinner, you're identifying with the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning and the truth is not in him. And he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And if your mindset's not right, he's going to accuse you day and night. But if any man be in Christ, there is no condemnation. So I break shame off you in Jesus' name. I break failure off you in Jesus' name. You've been called to royalty. So you're not a slave, you're royal. 
Don't let no one talk down on you like you're a side piece. You're not that. You're royal. Walk in your authority. And it's in your authority that you have your identity. That we trample on scorpions and serpents. Nothing shall harm us. I'm trying to deliver you from a religious mindset. You need a regal mindset. You're a son. You have privileges. And what does that mean? Let's look at Matthew 6. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. In Matthew 6, 8, Jesus says, Do not be like them, talking about the religious. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. How do we start this prayer? How do we pray this prayer? Our father. So the entry point into the kingdom is you recognizing God as So if you don't know God as father, you're going to pray amiss. How do I know that? Because the top of your prayers are going to have your needs first. Jesus just said the father knows what you need before you ask. So he was saying, listen, in order for you to pray like he prays, don't put put your needs at the top. Put your relationship with the father at the top. So Jesus says, if you go into prayer positionally, if you pray from your position as a son, you're not stressed over what you need. Because you have contentment, the Father knows what you need before you ask. If I, put the, if I put the Father's identity at the top, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not need. Our Father who art in heaven. If I pray for my needs first, I'm not praying properly. I'm praying amiss. Praise the Lord. Pray from your position. And the way that I pray from my position is I start recognizing him as my Father. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, your will be on earth as it is in. Let's read it again. Our Father who art in, hallowed be your, your kingdom. The first thing Jesus tells them to pray is not your kingdom wait. It's not your kingdom linger. The first thing he says is pray your kingdom what? So if Jesus told the 12 to pray your kingdom come, should the 12 be telling, should, should the church be telling the people that the kingdom is somewhere in the far future? Your kingdom? So we were instructed to pray your kingdom would come. And he said your kingdom come, your will be done in the world? Your kingdom come, your will be done in the... I'm trying to teach you that the world and the earth are not the same phrases. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? Another distinction. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are not the same things. The kingdom of heaven is where you go when you die, if you're saved. But the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven expressed on the earth. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of earth expressed in the earth. So when Jesus says to Peter, I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound where? That's the kingdom of heaven expressed on the earth. So when I pray thy kingdom come, what I'm saying is God bring your authority. God bring your law. God bring your covenant. God bring the culture of heaven on earth. I'm basically saying, bring the kingdom to the darkness at work. Thy kingdom come. I'm saying, bring the kingdom in my family. Thy kingdom come. I'm saying, God, bring your rulership over my situation. Thy kingdom come. And if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all else, did it say seek first the religion? Seek first the what? Kingdom. And everything else shall be. So we're so busy trying to get to heaven. And we're not trying to bring heaven down to earth. Shout thy kingdom come. Luke 17, 20 reads, speaking of Jesus, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. (laughs) He answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will you say, look here it is or there. Why? Because the kingdom is in the midst of you. Jesus said the kingdom's in the midst of you. The Greek word entos. He's saying the kingdom is inside of you. Place your hand in your chest and say the kingdom's in me. Say it like you have the Holy Spirit. The kingdom's in me. If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, then the kingdom's inside you. Heaven's inside you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the... The kingdom's inside you. So Jesus didn't save you simply for heaven. Jesus saved you for earth. He said that greater work shall you do. Jesus didn't save you because he's lonely. He saved you because he's got a purpose for you on the earth. Shout thy kingdom come. 
The Bible says in these last days, he's going to pour out his spirit on some flesh. Hmm. We've all been released to minister in the kingdom. It's not just one man of God. That's religion. This isn't about some being chosen. This is all of you are chosen. Place your hand on your chest and say, I'm chosen. All of you are co-heirs. All of you are ministers. All of you are royalty. Now we have to go to Matthew 12. Now, let me just make a distinction quickly. Let me tell you something. The church is not the kingdom. Can we say that together? The church is a part of the kingdom, but the kingdom's bigger than the church. The kingdom cannot be contained in the church. The kingdom cannot be contained three hours on a Sunday. The kingdom's 24-7. And if Jesus came today, he'd actually stand against many of our churches and denominations. Jesus doesn't want you reflecting the culture of religion. He wants you reflecting the culture of the kingdom. So the kingdom's bigger than the church. And the reason why you come to be a part of the church is so you can get education. Someone say education. Because this is where you get equipping. So the church is the academic wing of the kingdom. The church is the place of equipping. Am I making sense? This is why I don't understand why most people want to find their destiny in the church. There's a kingdom out there. You're not the salt of the church. You're the salt of the... There's a kingdom out there. You have to take what you learn inside here and advance the kingdom out there. So we get to Matthew 12, 28, and Jesus says this important scripture. But it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons. I need a scripture on the screen. Tech team, please. It is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons. And if that's the case, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The Bible says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So guess what? Whenever I exercise my authority to evict the demonic, whenever I command the God of this world's hold to come out of you, I have evicted, the, I've evicted Satan to give you access to the kingdom. Listen to what I'm saying. Deliverance is an official part of the kingdom. The kingdom is about warfare. Someone say warfare. We cast out demons not to populate the church. We cast out demons to advance the kingdom. Didn't Jesus cast out demons in the street? Did he only cast out demons in the church? There's a kingdom out there. Someone say the kingdom. So let me tell you this. Until your area of the world, until your church, until your workplace starts to look like heaven, you have work to do. Until that ex stops calling you and starts to see heaven inside of you, you've got work to do. I'm talking to you. Until that person stops calling your phone, and thinking they can get some, you have some work to do. Until they see heaven inside of you, you have work to do. Because until it looks like heaven, it's probably ruled by hell. Shout thy kingdom come. So we gather for official business on a Sunday, and we go out and we take our training out there in the world. We here are interested in you becoming like Jesus and changing your world. Jesus was in the world, but he was, as a son, he was faithful as a son in the house. So let me tell you something. You cannot grow in your identity in Christ. You cannot grow in sonship if you're not in the house of God. You must be raised in the house as a son. Listen to what I'm saying. This is what the church does for you. And this is the issue with most people. We start off with church membership. Someone say church membership. Church membership is when you become a member of a church, you join the fellowship. Then we push into church partnership. Someone say partnership. And partnership is where you become a part of the church. Then we go into discipleship. Someone say discipleship. Discipleship is where there's submission. This is communal, yeah? This is where you start to take ownership of your part in the, co in the congregation. Then we move into citizenship. Someone say citizenship. This is when you take the mindset of the kingdom. So what happens is most people become a member of the church. Then they start to partner with the church and start to serve in the church. Then they get into discipleship and submit to the church. Then they start to do kingdom living. What does the church do for you? When you become a member, you're supposed to push into partnership, push into discipleship so you can go into citizenship. We here in the church are in the business of creating disciples and making you into citizens, right? So we don't want people to just partner with this church. We want people to expand from here and go out into the world. I'm in the Anglican church. 
Daniel, Daniel was with Babylonian people, but he brought the kingdom. Joseph was in Egypt, but he brought the kingdom. Nehemiah was with Persia, but he brought the kingdom. What am I saying? Use what you get inside here and take the kingdom out there. Engage your world. Your Christianity is not about a Sunday. Your Christianity is not about a Sunday. Raise your hands and say it's not about Sundays. And let me tell you something. You don't overcome the world by simply prayer. You overcome the world by force. The kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So you take it by force. This isn't about just going into your prayer closet and doing shanda, shanda, shanda and rocking back and forward. This is about you changing the world around you. So stop being weird. Why are you talking in tongues at work? What are you doing? Become adaptable to the Jew. I became a Jew. To the weak, I became weak. And here's the issue that we have in Christianity. Sorry, I need to come down like this. But we evangelize with Christian jargon. Oh, do you want to get saved by the kingdom of God or repent for the kingdom of heaven? They don't understand what you're saying. So we evangelize like Christians, then we bring them into the church where it's worldly. Does that make sense? We have to use the world's culture and evangelize to them in their language, then bring them into our culture where it's... Stop being weird. Matthew 23. I, I just need to tell you, your Christianity is not about the pulpit. This isn't about Jesus in the church, it's about Jesus in the community. Matthew 23. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. If you've never heard about the kingdom, but you've been in church all this time, if, you, if you've never heard about the kingdom, but you've been in church all this time, that's religion. He says this, watch this, next part. Wait, actually, let's start again. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves, nor allow those who would enter to go in. Which means that le leaders have the power to close you to the door of the kingdom. By people refusing to teach it, they're not maturing you. We want to mature you so you can impact the world. The numbers in this church means nothing. The quality in this church means something. Amen? Jesus has assigned you to a kingdom. Let's get Luke twenty two twenty nine 29 on the screen, please. Jesus says, and I assign to you. Say I have an assignment. I assign to you a kingdom. I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom. I'm trying to put something in your mind that Jesus assigned you to a kingdom. He's given you a kingdom ass assignment. And when you start thinking kingdom and stop thinking religion, then you're going to start to understand the rest of the New Testament. You'll start to understand why Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. You'll start to understand some things in the Bible when you understand kingdom and not religion. All things are lawful. Not all things are helpful. So until we hop out of religion and hop into the kingdom, we're going to be a theater. We're going to be rehearsing, showboating, practicing, performing, and it won't be from the heart because that's not kingdom, that's religion. Let me tell you something, even when I'm emotional and I don't quite feel like ministering, in my brokenness, I'm going to minister. Why? Because when I'm weak, he is strong. I'm not going to let my emotions take over me coming to this place. When I'm weak, he is strong, his grace is sufficient. I have a thorn in my side, I will still minister. Even when I don't feel like interceding, even when I don't feel like preaching, that's when his power is made perfect. Why? Because I'm submitted. Just raise your hands and say I'm submitted. I'm not perfect. I'm not always on the ball, but I'm submitted. So listen, I know your week's been tough, but there's something powerful about putting worship where your pain is. There's something powerful about offering your body as a living sacrifice. There's something powerful about a broken and contrite spirit that God won't despise. And it's in the most painful times that his power's made perfect. So let me just tell you something as I begin to close. In the kingdom, he wants to come through you. God wants to come through you. If anyone meets you, they should be meeting Jesus. When they hear you speak, they should hear how Jesus speaks. When they think about your mind, they should hear how Jesus thinks. When people approach you, they should be appro approaching the kingdom of heaven. Raise your hands and say, I'm an, I'm, I am an ambassador. <laughs>
Keep it lifted and say, my life is a gate. So I'm going to show you something in Psalms 24 because you're a gate to the kingdom. You're a doorway into the kingdom. I'm going to show you right now. Psalms 24 verse 1, please. Watch this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of Jacob, Selah, it was here the whole time and we didn't see it. Verse 7. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Someone say gates. gates. Have you ever seen a gate with a head? <laughs> Have you ever seen a gate with a head? You are the gate. And when you lift up your head and stop walking around like a slave... When you lift up your head and stop walking around in condemnation. When you lift up your head and you start walking in your identity as royalty, as a co-heir, as joint with Jesus. When you walk in your royalty, you are a gateway to the kingdom. And when you lift up your head, then the king of glory may come in. Cut this religious nonsense out. Stop walking with your head low, feeling unworthy. I break shame off you in Jesus' name. I break condemnation off you in Jesus' name. Morning by morning, you mercies we have seen. He has washed you. Hallelujah. And though your sins be as scarlet, he has made them as white as snow. And he's going to write the law on your mind and in your hearts. And he will remember your sins no more. And your sins shall be at the end of the sea. Has anyone been to the bottom of the sea before? No. So how can he... He doesn't remember it. God has amnesia. He has amnesia over your sin. Over your past, he's covered it. He doesn't remember it. Stop walking around about what happened yesterday. It's done. It's over. I break it off you in Jesus' name. I feel like I need to lay hands. I break it off you in Jesus' name. I don't care if you're horny. You're a human being. You have desires. God created you. He created you with desires. Why are you putting yourself down because you have urges? You're a human. God created you with feelings. Don't beat yourself up because of it. Because when you do that and you get married, you're going to be the weirdest person. Be a human being. I break shame off you in Jesus' name. Lord have mercy. I break religion off you in Jesus' name. Come on. Kingdom and religion. And when you understand that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, then you start to see jealousy as childish, simple-minded, church stuff, gossip, goo goo gaga. What is that? Someone say yuck. But when you understand the kingdom was the point of Jesus, when you understand that your career is not the be-all and end-all of who you are, but who you are is a tool in the hand of God, Rowan is a teacher to bring the kingdom to our workplace. Shady is a, is a rapper to bring the kingdom to rap. Michael is an actor to bring the kingdom to acting. Lewis is a PT to bring the kingdom to personal training. The job is 1% of your identity. You are a child of God before your career. So you've been called to possess the gates of the devil. You've been called to go into the world and snatch people out of fire. Why are we afraid to get burnt? You've been called to warfare. So I don't know about you, but I've decided to come out of religion and I've decided to advance the kingdom. I've decided to fight on the Lord's side and not fight on the devil's side. I've decided to take any place that's occupied by the enemy and take it for the Lord. I've decided to go into all the world and let the kingdom of God come through me. What about you? 2 Corinthians 5.20 Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God is making his appeal through us God is making an appeal through you God chose you you are a gate and when people meet you they should be getting access to all that God is you're a gate you're an ambassador God is making his appeal through you 
Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to use you. You may not look like it now, but he loves people like you. You're exactly the way that he wants you to be. And you wouldn't be in the kingdom if he didn't want you. You wouldn't be saved if he didn't want you. You wouldn't be here right now if he didn't want you. God wants you as you are because it's the lowly things of the world that shame the wise. God wants you as broken as you are. <sighs> Hallelujah. Now, there's a reason why the kingdom couldn't be a month-long series. And the reason why we can't talk about the kingdom for one month is because everything in the kingdom is opposite. Right? People like status. Jesus says, if you want status, get on your knees. We can't teach the kingdom just for one month. And the grievance of God is that the average church worships Moses, not Jesus. The average church worships the law, not grace. And we've been in religion most of our life, but God wants to transition you from religion to the kingdom. God wants you to bring heaven to earth and not shut the kingdom in people's faces. He made you a temple of his so people can experience him through you. Am I making sense in this church? So God wants to use you. He wants to heal through you. He wants to deliver through you. Praise the Lord. And he has a will for your life. Frankie, he wants you to bring the kingdom to politics. God has a will for movies. The whole Bible is about visions. God has a will for movies. We just let all these movies be dark and all of that. But God wants actually for us to take that place. Right? So you didn't get saved for heaven. You got saved for her, earth. Because the heaven are the Lord's, but the world he has given to the children of men. So he gave you the heaven. So my whole point, guys, is live. My point is live. Jesus didn't come so you could be bound by religion, but so you could have life and have it more abundantly. So start that business. Graduate university. Do something. Live. Live. Come out of religion. You come out of religion. That's why you're depressed. Come out of it. Come out of a works mindset. No, no, keep, I'm giving it to you as real as I can. Come out of it. Because when you're working for his approval, you're going to get depressed. Because once you start to work, you're going to fail. And when you fail, you're going to have guilt. And when you have guilt, you're going to start getting narcissistic and it's all about me. And He approved you so you don't have to perform for him. If you perform, you're going to fail eventually. Then you're going to feel guilty because you failed and you're going to feel shameful. That's when condemnation creeps in. But you are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Not by works. Come out of religion. Go to a comedy show, go laugh. Go to a football game, laugh, live a little bit. And if the Holy Spirit prompts you while you're in that place, minister to someone. If Jesus wanted you out of the earth, why are you here? We've got baptisms. But if you're here and you want to be saved, matter of fact, everyone stand to their feet, please. If you're here and you want to be saved, and you're here and you want to be saved for real, you don't want to be saved into religion. You don't want to be saved because of church people. You don't want to be saved because you're afraid of death, but you're intrigued about Jesus and think you want to know this guy. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I'd like to ask you to just raise your hands. I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you.